Hi, uh, my name is Kim Flintoff. Um, this is a talk uh, given at a uh, TEDx at the University of Western Australia in July 2021. Uh, unfortunately, the recordings of the evening um, were lost, and I'm re recording this one uh, just for the sake of prosperity, I suppose. Um, I would like to share the ideas a bit broader, more broadly than uh, I did initially, so here we go. Um, I'd like to talk to you about uh, learning with purpose. There's nothing especially radical about the idea, but somewhere along the way, education and schooling have become quite a different proposition than the social undertakings that create meaning and connected learning. Many of us will remember a time in our first few years of schooling when we were asked to plant and observe the germination and growth of seed. In most classrooms, the teacher made all the decisions about how and why the seed would be planted, and the students were directed to take measurements, make observations, and keep a record of it all. Students then considered a range of factors about how seeds germinate, the factors that influence their growth, and what might be optimal conditions for growth. It was very simple, teacher-directed inquiry learning. In many classrooms today, that experience is still being played out, except some teachers have fallen into a habit of making some small but significant adjustments to the method. For a variety of well-meaning um, well reasons, teachers, teachers will often front load the experience with a lot of talk and information about how plants need water, nutrients, air and sunshine to grow. Then the experience of planting a seed is simply a confirmatory follow-up. It's become transmission with experiential confirmation. This model of practice often ends up replicating the factory model of schooling, dictating single pathways and prioritising the topic test type approach that is more concerned with coverage and results than emphasising the capabilities that encourage learning. Front-loading curriculum often removes relevance and purpose, and we sometimes see students trapped in a cycle of topic test and forget. But I read a story about a teacher who took a different approach. She entered her year two classroom and told her students about something very upsetting that she'd learned. She'd learned that there were millions of people in the world who had too little to eat, that there were people all over the world who were starving. She asked the class what they thought about that. They reported they felt sad, that it didn't seem fair, and that they'd like to share some of what they had with those hungry people. To cut the tale short, she engaged the students in thinking about solutions to a wicked problem. It didn't take long before the children started <clears throat> suggesting that perhaps they could teach people how to grow food in their gardens. At this point, the students had a purpose for planting a seed. At this point, they became active global citizens. And, and now it's very important to understand how plants grew and what could be done to help them grow well. Students had a responsibility to the starving people of the world to be able to teach others how to grow food producing plants. The shift was subtle but profound. The teacher still had all the evidence that her students had addressed the curriculum requirements in understanding the basics of plant germination and growth. There were still artefacts she could use to assess writing, recording, taking measurements, etc. But she also had a wealth of other evidence that related to problem solving, communication, collaboration, global awareness, critical and creative thinking, and personal learning. And even more importantly, her students were engaged because they cared. They were acting to make a difference, and they were discovering their connection and responsibility for other people in the world. Real world learning usually confronts us with a problem or a need before we have to search for the knowledge to solve it. In fact, John Dewey said it, we only think when we're confronted with problems. Real learning is messy, iterative, ad hoc, non-linear, sometimes social, sometimes solo. It's partial and it's imperfect. It's not packaged. It's relevant to our lives and the lives of those we care about. It's reactive and responsive. Learning to learn focuses on capabilities before content. In recent years, it's all about STEM learning. And as a former drama teacher, I probably taught more STEM than I realised. We engaged with human anatomy, biomechanics, human movement, voice production, sound, light, set design, construction, material science, electronics, programming, mathematics and more. And that was before we took into account the themes of the creative works that we developed and the scripts we worked with. One of my educational heroes was a man called John Carroll. John studied with Dorothy Hethcote and brought his learning back to Australia. Dorothy and John were both drama teachers too. 
They had a vision about how to make learners the experts as they learned. Dorothy translated her concept of the mantle of the expert into real world engagement and the commission model of learning. John refined and recontextualized a lot of his work and developed his own approach to situated role. And you won't be surprised when I tell you I had the opportunity to meet and learn from both of these wonderful people. The connections between the arts and other disciplines were well established. Drama is a way of knowing, and Dorothy and John showed me it is also a vehicle for meaningful engagement with real world concerns. When it came to thinking about STEM, it's not surprising that these ideas came floating back. STEM is all about the tools for solving problems. And other parts of our school learning provide the insights and the context that let us focus on problems worth solving. STEM makes sure you solve the problems right, but HASS and the arts make sure you solve the right problems. Without the ethical and moral frameworks, the critical and creative application of philosophy, politics, culture, and diversity, STEM is often driven exclusively as a servant of industry and economics. As global sustainability becomes more front of mind, it's my belief that all learning must be connected, that achievement without feeding back or paying forward is not sustainable and may even be unethical. Professor David Gibson and I proposed a framework for student learning based on some attributes that foster learning. We drew on well-established and research-informed categories and came up with the future ready attributes. Collaboration, creativity, problem solving, personal learning and global awareness. These five key capabilities can be mapped to all the other major frameworks in use in education around the world. They need some explanation and expansion, but they frame a skill set and a mindset that are about inclusion and connection. They incorporate the need to work with others, the expectation that communication is essential, that personal learning happens alongside and because of the need to work with and for others. Real world problem solving creates a need and a contact, context for learning with critical thinking and creativity at its core. As the corona or the COVID-19 pandemic began to influence our lives in early 2020, my colleague Tim Robry and I were contemplating the impacts on the work we were doing in schools. Tim's a design and technology teacher at a prominent art high school in Fremantle. And at the time I was the learning futures advisor for a major West Australian university. For the previous few years, we'd been working to bring a different mindset to STEM education. One of the projects Tim and I had been working on uh, drew together students, the Lewin Sale training ship, university academics, industry experts, and university students to design and create virtual reality assets that could be used for awareness, training, and orientation experiences relating to the STS Lewin. Suddenly, we all found ourselves working from home. And it was in that early window of working from home that the WA state government opened up an online platform called IPIC to allow the entire population of Western Australia to have a voice in the response to the, academic, uh, to the pandemic. Tim and I suggested something quite simple, that we also listen to the voice of young people in schools. We suggested that we use this opportunity to generate authentic learning experiences for WA school students to apply STEM-inspired, curriculum-linked, design thinking processes to solving real-world problems relating to the immediate and future impacts of COVID-19 and other community-related needs in Western Australia. Within days, it became the most discussed and most upvoted idea on the platform. STEM for Innovation was born. Tim and I found ourselves talking with Professor Fiona Wood about how this idea could be realised. In the course of our discussions, backdrop by the COVID crisis, Fiona explained how her workplace, one of Perth's major hospitals, was preparing for and being impacted by the threat of thousands of COVID patients. She described the concerns about how to deal with the possibility of COVID positive patients requiring surgery. And in her burns unit, this was a real challenge. It soon dawned on all of us that, it was, that this was exactly the sort of challenge that could be offered to students and teachers around WA. Soon after, Fiona was Zoom meeting a group of Tim's students from her operating theatre at the hospital. She was able to show the situation she was dealing with and walk students through the very spaces she and her colleagues worked in each day. She was able to show the complexities and difficulties they faced in trying to perform their life-saving work with the added layer of an out-of-control contagion. Students in that experience learned a lot about the realities of the health system, healthcare, and working as a health professional. 
They learned that the operating theatre is heated to 34 degrees because the human body with severe burn cannot regulate itself. That there are many layers of PPE and precise protocols for sterilisation and hygiene. That burns patients are regularly manoeuvred on the operating table to allow Fiona to harvest tissue to be used in skin grafts that assist with the repair and healing of burning, burned flesh. And that with the growing obesity crisis in Australia, sometimes her patients can be so large that there are increased risks to the patient and hospital staff when the patient has to be moved. The students had the opportunity to ask questions, to clarify gaps or misunderstandings, and to develop real empathetic insights into the lived experience of those affected by the problems they were starting to identify. The students present were also charged with being representative of other students who would come to the hospital immersion challenge. Students were offered the challenge to find solutions for the difficulties that Fiona had described. A video of the event was made and Tim and I communicated with more than 150 schools that we had connection with through the Learning Futures Network. More than 60 schools expressed an interest in being involved and eventually we piloted the challenge with 22 schools and more than 700 students around the state. This wasn't any mere hackathon. This was the first instance of a responsive, adaptive, contributory, community-linked and future-focused mode of learning built on STEM priorities and collaborative design thinking processes. Three weeks later, we had a collection of solution proposals to offer Fiona. We selected about a dozen interesting proposals and invited the student creators to pitch their ideas to an event at Tim's school. The pitches were offered to an audience made up of representatives from government, industry, the health sector, higher education, and of course, some very proud families and teachers of the students presenting. The students added some evidence to John's Dewey's assertion that when we give pupils something to do, not something to learn, and the doing is such a nature as to demand thinking, learning naturally results. STEM for Innovation is built upon this idea of purposeful learning as well as enabling student voice so that there are opportunities for learners to begin to shape the future that they have to deal with. Young people contributing to new visions of the future that appear so volatile. Developing understanding of the systems and dynamics that seem so uncertain. Participating in the communication that unpacks the complexity and applying the requisite agility to pivot when they encounter ambiguity. Since our first deep dive into STEM for Innovation, we've evolved and grown. STEM priorities around our next health challenge have become embedded across virtually all learning areas at Tim's school. And as Tim says, look for STEM in your subject, not your subject in STEM. The acrimony of trying to modify the acronym to reflect it all has started to abate. In my school, the first early steps towards interdisciplinarity are underway. The scope of STEM for innovation has grown to invite all manner of industry and community challenges under the broad umbrella of six community tracks. As our next health and wellbeing challenge gets underway, the issue being brought to us by a team of upper GI and bariatric specialists who have become frustrated with trying to address the challenges of lifestyle diseases. Our students are once again encouraged to learn with purpose. Our students are examining the problem, understanding the issues and the effects, and developing real outputs that will contribute to the efforts of the doctors involved. Our students are producing a variety of work that have a positive impact in many different ways. They are sharing the responsibility for improving health, comes for all, health outcomes for all West Australians. They are still providing the evidence to enable assessment, but it's on their terms. There's no single pathway being followed. Teachers are allies and supporters of the deep learning that's occurring, and our communities are seeing that young people aren't learning to prepare for life. They are actually deeply engrossed in living their life through the learning experiences that enable them to be active and compassionate citizens with growing awareness of the futures they want to create. Our students are active agents in their own learning. They rely on each other to achieve high order outcomes. They connect and contribute to the world beyond the school gate. They are networking with real stakeholders and our students are leading the learning and curriculum follows. Our students are learning with purpose. Remember that seed? There's a metaphor in there. Watch it grow. Thank you.